Hello and welcome to Catch Up with Community Church. It's great to have you listening to us today. Today we have David Berriman, and he's going to be talking to us about prayer. And as it's our prayer Sunday, we're not just going to be listening. There's going to be multiple opportunities to pause the sermon and to get into prayer or to wait on the Lord. Before we get into the preach, however, I just want to remind you of our four field training coming up in June on the 6th to the 8th. This is an intensive course that equips people who want to multiply disciples and churches to the glory of God. To find out more and book your place, please check out our website. But for now, let's get into the preach. We're in uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, please, in your Bibles. Nehemiah chapter 1, when we, when we come to prayer, um, there are some really helpful um, biblical examples of prayer, um, and Nehemiah is a great example for us. And so we're going to use this uh, for our prayers. So I'm just going to outline um, what, what I think we see here in Nehemiah um, and his approach to prayer, and then we're going to try and follow that approach uh, in our praying together this morning. So Nehemiah, um, Nehemiah, of course, is the last narrative that we have in the Old Testament history, um, even though it's not the old last book in the Bible that we've got, but it is the, the, about 445 BC, uh, and, and, and this is the last narrative that we have before Jesus comes. Okay, so Nehemiah, uh, the restoration of the walls, rest, Ezra, restoration of the temple, um, that's just the last thing that we have in the Old Testament about restoration. It's wonderful. Um, let's, let's read um, Nehemiah chapter 1. Read the whole chapter. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in, the, in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped and who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who has survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments the statutes and the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in uttermost parts of heaven, from there, sorry, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Amen. Four things I, I think this teaches us about prayer. Number one. If we look at verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. So as we come to hear things, and we're, Nehemiah, he internalizes the burden. Okay? He, he, deep, he has a deep understanding and ownership of the need. 
You know, he doesn't just say, oh, well, that's them in, in, in Jerusalem. I'm over here uh, in Susa. It doesn't really affect me. No, no, he, he owned the, the, the problem. He, he internalized it. it. It was deep in him. And, and even when he came to talking about confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which I have, uh, which we have, even I and my fathers have sinned, you know. So there's something about owning the problem, owning what's going on. And, and in prayer, we own what's going on. It may not directly affect us in some ways, but actually we've got the heart of God. We've got the compassion of God. We've got the vision of God. We know what, what, how the world should be. And, and when it's not as it should be, it should deeply affect us. When we hear uh, of people that are ill, uh, people that are struggling, that, sh that we should stand with them in prayer because we, we should own that. The Bible says, one, one, one mourns, we all mourn. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. You know, we, we should own the problem. We should own these things. You know, and, and there are things that we can pray for that, that we, we should be owning. The, the, the vision of the church, the lost that are all around us, that should, that should deeply stir our prayers. It's no good saying, oh, that's the eldest problem. Let them get on with it. Well, that's the evangelist problem. Let them get on with it. Now, every one of us should be deeply moved by these things. We need to internalize the burden. We need to own it, deepen our ownership of the need, number one. Number two, again in verse four, I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And uh, I, for days and days, he would do this. Um, and there's something about insisting that we quiet our hearts, wait, slow down, to come before God and to receive from God. He didn't just rush off and say, right, now I know what I'm going to do. Uh, I, 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 I'm owning this problem. I'm going to get on and do it. No, he waited before God. He stopped. He prayed. He fasted. He worshipped. In our... Um, prayer on Zoom this morning and Fidel was leading us and he talked about uh, waiting and I think that's been a bit of a theme of our 10 days already, waiting on God. What is God saying? We, we know the problem, we know uh, how uh, we, we own in this, uh, we, our hearts are moved but Lord what, what are you saying? How are you going to lead us in this? What is your direction? And so, so, first of all, he internalizes the burden. Secondly, I think prayer insists that we quiet our hearts, okay? Prayer helps us to do that. It makes us do that. It makes us stop. Number three, prayer infuses the vision, enables us to see what God sees. If we look at, at uh, what happened was in verse uh, eight, they were scattered Amongst the people. But, but Nehemiah held in his heart the vision that actually, though your outcasts are in the utmost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen to make my name dwell there. There's, there's a vision here. There's, this, is, this is what God has promised. This is what he said he would do. And, and prayer keeps the vision in our minds. It keeps us the big picture. Again, as we talk about Revelation tonight in our little study group, it will give us the big picture. Actually, no, God is in control. God does get the victory. You know, and, and prayer enables us to keep the vision in mind. It brings us back to what God is doing, what he has promised, uh, and, and it keeps us back onto those things. And Nehemiah says, Lord, you promised these things. You have said that, that you will gather them in. And, and he's bringing those things back to God. So prayer keeps the vision of God in our minds. And as a church, the, the vision that God has put over us, we come to pray, we are praying for those things. And it keeps it in mind. And then finally, prayer initiates the vision's fulfilment uh, and it's a catalyst for us to act. It's interesting, uh, all the way, there's eight times that he, uh, Nehemiah uses the word servant. He knew his place, he knew where he was, and he talked about servant Moses, servant Israel, I'm your servant, your servants. Eight times he uses that word. And he grounds all this at the end of chapter 1. It says, give success to your servants today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. You see, Nehemiah knew 
that actually this is all grounded in, in who I am and what I do. Uh, it, when I was in Seoul, I did a session on vision and, and talk about global vision, reaching the nations. I talked about local vision, reaching your community. But I also talked about personal vision. How can you be involved in what God has called us to? When we just leave it as a global thing or a local thing, it doesn't really personalise it. Nehemiah didn't do that. He personalised it. He said, I'm, I'm a cupbearer to the king. This is my job. This is what I do. You might want to put your, your uh, job in that place. You know, I, I'm a nurse at the hospital, I'm a teacher in the school, or I, you know, I'm a businessman, or I'm in IT. That's who I am. We personalise it because it's got to be worked out in everyday life. He grounds it. Prayer grounds this vision in fulfilment and gives us the catalyst to say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. How do I respond to this? And of course, um, Nehemiah, uh, we go through chapter 2, Nehemiah wants an audience with King Artaxerxes, that's what he's after here. That's what he's asking the Lord for. But you notice, before he gets an audience with King Artaxerxes, he wants an audience with the King of Kings. And before we step out and get to where we think God is calling us, we must be abiding. We must be with the King of Kings. He will then grant us fruitfulness. You know, that's what Jesus said, I am the vine, you know, and, and you've got to abide in me if you want to be fruitful. And so about coming in prayer before God, before we then go to act. And that's what Nehemiah was doing. So four things, internalises the burden, so we really own these things that really stir us. Prayer insists that we quiet our hearts. So when you, when you pray, I mean, prayer can be noisy, there's no doubt about that. You know, you've only got a bit of some of our prayer meetings. It can be noisy, but it can also be quite quiet. You know, when we, again, are coming back to Revelation, the set of the, the, the seal, seventh seal, it says, and there was quietness in heaven. You think, wow, you know, they've just culminated all of this, and yet there was quietness, there was a stillness, there was a, a calm. So prayer, insist that we quiet heart. Prayer infuses vision, enables us to see what God sees, and prayer really initiates the vision in our own personal lives. It's a, it's a catalyst to act. It stirs us to do something. And that's what we're going to be doing this morning. Uh, we're going to go through those four things, looking at this and praying together for this. Now, if you're here for the first time, um, we, we're going to be praying together. If you, we're going to be getting into groups. We're going to be praying all together. We're going to do lots of little things over the next half an hour. Um, and uh, so if, if you're here for the first time and not really sure, just, just stand and watch or stand and listen. Uh, you're welcome to join in, of course. Um, you're welcome to join in. But if you're unused, un, not used to these sort of things, then just, just sit and watch and, and, and be part of that in a group. Um, but we will be getting to groups. We will be praying through some of these things together. Um, and we'll be we're coming back and worshipping as well. So let's start in prayer, shall we? First of all, uh, in in internalizing the burden what is God laying on your heart I, I think some things we can pray about this morning and I'm going to give a freedom for the spirit to move you might have other things that the Lord lays on your heart and we can share for those share those things as well but but firstly I want to has to have a burden for the lost if we truly believe that Jesus is the only way to God because that's what he teaches Jesus is the only way to God that anyone who does not come by Jesus will not be saved. If we truly believe in a heaven and a hell, surely that should stir our hearts to pray. To pray for the lost. You might have friends, work colleagues, neighbours that are lost. They're not followers of Jesus. Surely we should be praying for these people. And so that's one of the first things, to, to the burden, that the owning this. Lord, we're going to be praying, we're going to be fasting for the lost, and we've been praying for a harvest of souls. Uh, we can pray for that. We can pray for the burden of the church in the UK. Most, a lot of the church are, are drifting from the Word of God. They're not staying to the Word of God. They're not, not keeping word-based. They're, they're letting culture influence what they're teaching and preaching. We, we must have a burden for that. These are our brothers and sisters that are being led astray by false teaching. We must pray for them. And then, of course, the burden for community church. The Lord has called us to plant many churches. Now, that's not just a vision for the elders. That's a burden for all of us to be 
you're praying and fasting for. You know, so I've given you three things there. Praying for the lost, praying for the church, uh, praying for the vision to reach the lost and, and to plant churches. What I want to do is just encourage you to get into groups of five and six and start to pray. So just stand up. Uh, if you're able to stand, it's just to stand up. We'd have this time of standing. Uh, move around, use the space that's available. Get into groups of, of, of five and six and start praying for some of these burdens that should be on our hearts, these things that, that really stir our hearts. I mean, Nehemiah wept and he fasted because God had touched his heart. We should be weeping and fasting over some of these things. They should be high in our prayer list. We should be serious about these things. So let's start together. Let's get into groups of five or six uh, and let's pray uh, for some of these things that God has laid upon your heart, some burdens uh, that we need to cry out to God for this morning. Is that okay? Let's stand up. If you're able to stand, please stand and, uh, uh, and then get into groups of five and six and I'm going to give you 10 minutes to pray. continue to pray in your groups can I encourage you to pray for the vision that God has called us to pray for our Basildon church plant please uh, pray for them as they meet pray for church plants to flow out as we make disciples across Thurrock into Essex and into the regions beyond so pray for the vision that God has called us to pray for Basildon pray for future church plants uh, continue to pray in your groups for these things please One of the things that Nehemiah did was to wait upon the Lord. Um, I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Um, Acts chapter 6, no, Acts chapter 13, sorry. Uh, as they were worshipping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, and there's something about waiting upon the Lord in worship, in fasting, in prayer, Sometimes, I mean, I think it's Ecclesiastes 5 tells us, uh, let your words be few. Sometimes there's a time not to say much and just to listen. You know, not to say many words, but just to listen to what God is saying. Uh, in fact, um, if you take Nehemiah 1, um, the Chislev in, in verse 1 uh, is the ninth month of the year. And when you get to chapter 2, uh, the month of Nisan is the first month of the year. So actually, Nehemiah was waiting on God for three months before he acted. Three months of praying, three months of fasting, three, three months of listening to God before he acted. I wonder if I invite the worship band to come back, uh, if you don't mind, Michelle and the team, to come back and just to maybe play again, um, waiting here for you, for us. I'm not, you can join in and sing if you want, or you can just be silent and just listen. But a time to wait upon God. We don't often do this uh, so much. So time to wait, a time to listen, a time to see what God is saying. What, what is God saying to us? What worry too much about straight lines as long as you've got somewhere to stand and, to, and sit. What is God saying to us? A, a time to wait. And then, and then maybe we'll have a time of just sharing what, what is the Lord saying. It might be to us as a church corporately. It might be to you personally as you've been praying. Please feel free to join in and sing, but feel free just to stand and, in awe of God and wait and see what the Lord is saying. Nehemiah said, I continued fasting and praying before the Lord of heaven. Let's come before the Lord of heaven. Let's see what he wants to say to us. We've prayed to him. We've called out to him about some of the burdens that are on our hearts, some of the vision that we believe he's called us to. But what is the Lord saying? So take this time just to reflect, just to listen and to wait. One of the things I think about our 10 days of prayer, it's going to be a time of waiting. A time of waiting. 
And let the Spirit move. Let the Spirit come upon us. Let the Spirit speak to us. The Holy Spirit said, Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said, what is the Spirit saying to you? Let's wait upon Him. Let's just uh, enjoy this time with God. Let's listen to what He's saying. Nehemiah finishes chapter one by saying, I was cupbearer to the king. That's where God had placed him. Where has God placed you? Where has God put you? What would you put there in your role where God has put you? Because it's not an accident that God has put you there. It wasn't an accident that Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. God had placed him there for purpose. And Nehemiah actually went into the king's presence and asked for an audience with the king. And by doing that, he was risking his job. He was risking his life by stepping out. You see, he put kingdom first. He knew where God had put him, but it was kingdom first. Mark John, um, John Mark Comer says in his book about discipleship, he says, a disciple of Jesus is somebody who organizes their life around following Jesus. You're where you've got has put you. Your role, your job, your family, your community. He's put you there for purpose. He's put you there for purpose. What is God saying about your purpose? If we just have this global vision, or even a local big vision, and you don't ground it personally in how you're involved, then it's not meaningful for you. You're not praying into these things meaningfully. So what is God saying to you? What is your role in the kingdom of God? What's he called you to? What's the vision for your life as part of the vision that God has called us to? Every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, have a part to play. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. Where's God placed you? And are you willing to lay it all down for the sake of Jesus? Are you willing to do that? Just take a few moments just to really ground this in, in each, each of our lives just now. Nehemiah saw the big picture. He saw the, the distress and, and the turmoil that the people of God were in. He internalized that. He owned it. He wept about it. He prayed about it. He held on to the promises of God. But he grounded it all the way back into him personally. God used Nehemiah wonderfully. Great leader, great man of God. God's got plans and purposes for each one of us. He wants us to be fruitful. It comes out of our abiding, it comes out of our waiting. But he wants fruitfulness for each one of us. What is God saying to you? Thank you. Lord, we thank you that as we come before you, we wait upon you, your spirit speaks to us. I want to pray for every person here, Lord, as we've waited upon you, Lord, there will be those that have heard your voice, I so thank you for that, Lord. I pray that they will take hold of that which you have spoken to them today, and they will walk in it, Lord. Be obedient to what you've said to them. Those that, that maybe not yet heard uh, your voice or not heard for you, I pray they'll continue to wait. Nehemiah waited three months uh, before he put it into action. Lord, I pray that we won't give up, that we'll persevere in prayer to seek you, to seek your ways, to seek your purposes for each one of us. And Lord, as we continue over this next week for, in our 10 days of prayer, Lord, I pray that we will hear from you. There will be times of waiting. There will be times of listening. There will be prophetic words flowing through that will direct our ways. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we can come before you in prayer. 
Lord, we, as, as Nehemiah went in front of King Artaxerxes, he wasn't sure what response he was going to get. He could have been thrown in prison. He could have been killed. He could have been, all sorts of things could have happened to him. But Lord, we know that when we come before your throne, you receive us. You welcome us. You invite us in. That we don't have to worry about what reaction we get because we're coming to a loving, just, holy, compassionate, gracious God to thank you that we can have boldness to enter in and help us to enter in regularly. Help us to enter in daily and through our day together as a church and individually. So Lord, continue to speak and guide us over these days so that your name will be lifted high, that your church will be built and glorified and the name of Jesus proclaimed in our communities, in our nation and into the nations, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to us today. We hope you had a great time learning and praying. And if you've not been to one of our sites before we meet in Chafford 100, Chadwell St Mary, South Ockenden and Basildon, please contact us to find out more.